Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us for this session uh, called Bringing Home Truth. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I feel particularly privileged to be sitting on the stage with two people that I've admired for a very, very long time. Uh, Alan Little, uh, who ha for a long time has been a colleague of mine at the BBC uh, and does lots of other things now too, and Christina Lamb, who is the chief uh, foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times. Uh, she tells me the only correspondent for the Sunday <laughs> Times, not necessarily <laughs> the chief foreign correspondent. Perhaps we can talk about that. Um, I, I find myself in a, in a really rather interesting position, and, and I don't know how discomforting it is for to... Um, they're described as veteran journalists in the, um, in the, in the, in the blurb, but, um, which perhaps Makes just suggests old, old, but no. Seasoned and very experienced, I think we're going to go with. Um, sitting with two journalists who have spent their life telling stories and asking questions. So for me to ask them questions might be somewhat discomforting. I hope, I hope not. Um, so we're, we're, we're talking about bringing home truth, but I, I, before we talk about the whole notion and questioning of truth that we've seen in, in the last um, six, seven months or so um, in the United States, which is uh, clearly defining our, um, our sense of what truth means these days, or at least informing it in a different way. I, I want to really start by just talking about um, how you two got to where you are now. So uh, it, it would be great, I think, if, if you just told us a little bit about why it is that you not wanted to be journalists, but why you were interested in being foreign correspondents, because that's what you've devoted your lives to, even if you started somewhat more modestly. Alan, you started in, um, in Scotland. I did. I, started, I went to university in Edinburgh. I grew up in Scotland. And I, uh, from a very young age, I was fr from, from primary school times, I, I was interested in the wider world. I grew up in a little village in Galloway in the southwest, and everybody knew everybody, and everybody's grandparents had known everybody's grandparents. And it was, it was a joy being brought up in that kind of community as a child. Uh, my friend Alistair Reid, the, the Scots poet who died three years ago now, grew up in a, in a nearby village, and he called it his Eden. And he grew up there in the 1920s and 30s. And, and when I look back at my childhood, it was almost idyllic. It was a wonderful place to be a child. Terrible place to be an adolescent and a teenager. You can't wait to get out. And I remember as a child, uh, from, my, from the upstairs bedroom of my grandparents' house where we stayed from time to time, you could see the great arc of the Mull of Galloway lighthouse sweeping around. Um, it's miles away, but you could still see it here. On a foggy night, you could hear the foghorn. And I used to lie there dreaming or think, thinking about the great ships on the out at sea who could see the same light as me and wondering where they were going and who was on board and I had a map of the world and I got a little I had a little booklet at the age of about seven and it had all the countries of the world listed with their capital cities and their populations and some of these countries were new countries it's the 1960s some of them had only recently come into existence and the idea that a country could be new seemed to me completely intriguing. So I, I kind of fell in love with the idea of the big wide world and getting out there uh, very, very young, and it never really left me. Christina, what about you? Was, was there something about the world that interested you when you were very young, or did that come later? Um, well, I really wanted to be a novelist. Um, and I, I grew up in South London, and the mobile library used to come twice a week. I don't think those exist anymore. And I used to love reading about faraway places and actually uh, really about explorers. I think in an earlier age, I'd like to have been an explorer. Um, but actually, I sort of became a foreign correspondent by accident because I, um, when I left university, I interned at the Financial Times for a couple of weeks in the summer. And one day, the foreign editor was supposed to go to a lunch of South Asian politicians and last minute couldn't go. And he said to me, oh, why don't you go? You're always going on about India. And I've been there on, uh, as a student. So I went to this lunch and sat next to somebody who is the Secretary General of the Pakistan People's Party, which is Benazir Bhutto's party. And he asked me if I'd like to interview Benazir. So of course I said yes. And at that time she was living in exile in London and Pakistan was under military dictatorship. So I went to interview her, and the day I interviewed her was the day that she announced her engagement to Asif Ali Zadari. So her flat in London was absolutely full of bouquets of flowers. And we got on very well. She couldn't be written about at that time in the Pakistani media because of censorship, so she was very 
reliant on foreign media telling her story. And she was very good at charming foreign correspondents, particularly men, I think. <laughs> so, anyway, she, she then, I wrote my story. I then went to work in Birmingham as a trainee in central TV, local TV. And she went back to Pakistan. And one day I came home from work and there was this most beautiful gold inscribed invitation on my mat, which was to Benazir's wedding in Karachi. <laughs> Um, so you clearly so charmed her too. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like my first introduction to Pakistan, and it was amazing because you know any of you that have been to South Asian weddings will know you'll know that they go on for a long time and they're spectacular. And it being Benazir, it was amazing. But also every evening there were these gatherings in what had been her father's house um, with her political colleagues to discuss trying to topple the military dictator. And so I was meeting these people who'd been tear gassed, tortured, arrested to try and bring democracy to Pakistan, and which was something you know I'd always taken for granted. And I was just fascinating. I mean, the most dangerous thing I'd ever done at that point was finding my way home late at night from central London if I missed the last train. <laughs> so, um, so I gave him my notice and went to Pakistan. And actually the last story I ever did for Central TV was a man who turned his car back to front so it looked like it was going forwards when it was going backwards. <laughs> 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 so, so that early introduction to the fight for, for democracy, the fight for truth. I mean, I, I, I wonder how much that informed your desire to be at the forefront, to be at the front line of, of not necessarily revealing, but sharing with people who weren't there yeah. what, what was happening. Absolutely, because I, I mean, things I'd never really thought about then talking to these people who had taken these in incredible risks, I just was fascinated. So, um, but when I talked to foreign editors in London about Pakistan, nobody was interested. They said to me, General Zia has been there for 11 and a half years, nothing's going to change. And I was like, no, but Benazir's gone back and she's going to bring democracy. And they obviously thought, you know, she's 21, she didn't know anything. <laughs> and, um, but they were. what they said to me was, we are interested in Afghanistan because at that time um, the Russians were in Afghanistan. So I ended up going to live in Peshawar and... Uh, going in and out of Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. And, uh, I mean, I was just, f from the first time I went to Afghanistan, just really fascinated by it and never imagined it would be part of my life for quite so long because if anybody had told me then that I would be back there um, 20 years later covering my own country <laughs> fighting in Afghanistan, I would have thought they were mad. Alan, from that teenager who could see that there was a bigger world beyond the, the life that you had led up until that point, was, was there a moment when you thought, actually, telling people about the world is something that I want to do? Yeah, well, there's a desire to find out and not, not read about it at a breakfast table in London or Edinburgh and, and to go and bear witness for oneself for its own sake, but also to be... When I was a teenager, I, I, I grew up in a working class family in Scotland. I'd never been abroad before until I got a chance when I went to university. And, and in the summers at university, I used to go backpacking around Europe. And the first place I went to at the age of 19 was Sarajevo. Wow. Because I wanted to, and Tito was still alive, because I wanted to go to the place where I'd come to think of the 20th century as having started, which is to say with the two shots fired by Gavriel Princip that killed the... Uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and I wanted to sort of stand in that spot and try and imagine the century as it looked to that generation of 1914, who, who knew the start but didn't yet know the outcome. We can never unlearn the outcome, but it's always intriguing to me to, to try to consider uh, the start of things before the outcome is known. And even at 19, I was, I was um, intrigued by that. But there's a great uh, uh, passage by, written by Martha Gellhorn in 1959 in the year that I was born, in fact, and um, she's writing about her own career. And I've read it so often that I cannot, I, I'll, I'll get it slightly wrong, but I've almost memorized it. She says, when I was young, I believed in progress and in the perfectibility of mankind. And I thought of journalism as a guiding light. It was a journalist's job to be eyes and ears for the conscience of the world. 
And she said, uh, who was to do, all that was necessary for an injustice or a wrong to be righted was that it should be made known. Whose job it was to decide what the saving action should be, I didn't care about. My job was simply to bear witness. And she said, I think I must have thought, as pub a thought of public opinion as, as a solid force, something like a hurricane always ready to blow on the side of the angels. Mm. And I think I probably felt that too. And she says uh, it took, you know, two, uh, took a, a Spanish civil war, a world war, a Korean civil war and several revolutions and upheavals to, to dissuade her of this delusion. And your early years as a foreign correspondent, when I, when I started as a foreign correspondent, I, my first big story really was the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. And then after that, I was straight into the invasion of Iraq and, or the, the liberation of Kuwait. And I spent the, 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 the war weeks in, in Baghdad. And then after that, I was straight into the former Yugoslavia. I went for two weeks to Yugoslavia and I stayed for four years. And I think I carried that sense that public opinion was was a something like a tornado always ready to blow on the side of the angels into the killing fields of Bosnia with me. I didn't bring it home again. I didn't uh, bring that illusion home with me after four years there. And uh, But I still think of journalism at its best as a kind of guiding light, as a kind of the eyes and ears for the conscience of the world. And there is some, still some very fine journalism. I'm, I must say, I feel slightly fraudulent sitting next to Christina, who is one of the greatest of our times, I think. And uh, uh, so I still, I still carry that, not a delusion, but a sense of th th that at its best it can be something fine. Let, let, let's talk about that, because there, there, there is a real distinction to be made when you look at war reporting during the Second World War and what came after, the wars that came after, because clearly the Second World War was a tectonic shifting place of a war, and it was a, a war that was to do with uh, the sense of survival, whereas many of the other wars, even though I hear some people, including our own, my own, the BBC's own, Jeremy Bowen, talk about the war in Syria as being as close as we've come to a world war because of the, the, the players, the international players that are involved. There is a big difference between the way in which the Second World War was reported and the wars that have come since, even though there have been so many international players involved, for example, in Syria and Afghanistan and so on. And it does go to the heart of how you report it and how the, the necessity for impartiality becomes the thing that, that matters. Is that something that you've both thought about, Christina? Yeah. I... And not least because you said when you talked about Afghanistan, saying, you know, our, our, our troops going back to, to fight in Afghanistan. I was really struck by that. Yeah, I... It's difficult. I mean, I, I think what I learned right from the beginning... So I guess it's unusual to start off covering war, not do anything else really before. And, <laughs> um, and so because of that, I was very naive. But in a way, that was quite good because I went with no preconceptions. And I was... I thought till then, I believed everything I read in the newspapers and on TV and... Um, I got there and I had had this image from everything that I'd read and seen that the war in Afghanistan was very black and white, that the Mujahideen were the good guys, they had um, very little equipment, that they'd sort of men from the mountains with sort of rope sandals and fighting the evil Russian sort of um, one of the most powerful armies on earth. And so to then discover it wasn't like that at all, that it was actually really complicated, that a lot of the fighting was very tribal and a lot of the Afghans were fighting each other and often the Russians were nothing to do with it. Um, you know, that made me realize, you know, you, you need to be there and actually see. And these things are not black and white ever. They're always gray. And that it's our job to do, that, you know, explain that to people and also to let people speak for themselves and tell their own stories. Um, and so that, you know, that's what I feel I'm sort of trying to tell stories of people that don't have any way of getting their stories out themselves. And like Alan said, I don't think any of us would do this job if you didn't feel that you could change things through it. Uh, Alan, when, when Christina talked about the foreign desk not being interested in 
Benazir's story and you know she was 21 she wasn't interesting and and actually I mean that shifted very quickly because she was such a fantastic speaker and she was photogenic and and so on and people were interested because she was a a a viable politician in the context of Pakistan but I, I, I wonder how much appetite there was when you were first starting out for the stories from places that people could barely pronounce mm. back in London and, and, and the responsibility in terms of just pitching, you know, just being able to persuade an editor to send you. The, yeah, it's funny. The, the, uh, the experience of trying to sell Bosnia to the desk uh, was interesting because it's not that there wasn't an appetite. There was an appetite for a certain interpretation. And the interpretation was... It's the Balkans. They do this every couple of generations. All sides are equally guilty. There's nothing that can be done. That was not the war that I was experiencing. It was not a war in which all sides were equally guilty. And I used to argue, you know, if you go into a pub and there are two guys at the bar arguing, one's arguing 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the other one's arguing with great conviction that 2 plus 2 equals 6, it's never right to say the truth lies somewhere in between. <laughs> and that's what I was being asked to do. <laughs> And uh, so I said, no, I'm going to call this. I'm going to make judgments about, on the one hand, this side says that. On the other hand, that side, side says the opposite. I'm going to make judgments about the quality of evidence upon which the two assertions are based. And it's not always wrong to give more weight, more credibility to one side. Uh, and that was, the, that was the fight I had all the time with the desk in London because the, 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 the pervasive way of seeing that war was really written by the two governments, the British and French governments, who didn't want to get involved and already had troops on the ground keeping a peace in a country where there was no peace to be kept. And they didn't want to get drawn in. And if all sides are equally guilty, you have no moral responsibility to come to the aid of the wronged against. Uh, and it took three and a half years and 110,000 lives uh, until the, the democracies of Western Europe changed their minds. And so that was a very, for me, a very defining experience. The, the, Christina, when you talked about telling the stories of those who who don't have a voice, the the last uh, the last two books that you've written, uh, the one that you wrote with Malala, I am Malala, about Malala Yousafzai, and also your book about Najin Mustafa, the girl from Aleppo. I, I I wonder whether there has been a shift that one of the ways in which these stories can be told is by really focusing on an individual? Well, I, I think it's easier for people to kind of understand the situation if they can hear it through one person's story. So I think, you know, we're all always trying to find um, a good st um, story to tell the situation through. Um, but I also, you know, this job covering conflicts and wars would be really grim if all you wrote about was the sort of bad people doing bad things. So I'm always trying to find people that actually show even in these situations you can make a difference and that there are people out there who are trying to do something. So Malala obviously um, you know, risked her life to go to school and to enable other children to go to school. Um, and Najin was one of the refugees that crossed from Syria to Germany, um, did it in a wheelchair, which was amazing because even for able-bodied people, that's such a difficult journey. And I wanted to tell her story because it, she's really funny and um, she speaks fluent English, which she's learned from watching American soap operas in her flat in um, the fifth floor in Aleppo. And she just had a really upbeat sort of outlook on what she went through. Of course, it was really difficult and you can't hide that. But I did think that the reason I wanted to do that book was because I'd been covering the refugee crisis for quite a while. And it seemed to me that people were talking about the refugees as this mass of people. You had politicians using words like a plague or epidemic, almost as though they were a disease. And that actually, if you met the people and listened to their individual stories, you know, there were people like us. And so... I really wanted to tell the story through one person. The, 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 the two things that both of you have just talked about, the, the, the 
sometimes a chasm between hope and despair that that you both have to encounter and 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 look at i i wonder if we can just talk a little bit about the impact this makes on you mm. as the person who is the bearer uh, you know the witness who's who's sharing this the the kind of first draft of history chronicler mm. um is is this something that you you're still both working as foreign correspondents, but is this something that you look back on and notice that there was a time when something did make you think, this is making an impact on me, on my psyche, on my emotions, in a way, on my health, in a way that actually is, I need to just stop for a moment. Alan? Yeah, you've got to monitor yourself and, and, and it manifests itself quite often in a jadedness, uh, a, a numbness to the pain of others. <clears throat> and when you start feeling numb to it you've got to take a break you got to, when you stop feet when you stop empathizing with people you've you've immersed yourself in it for too long and i'm very conscious of that in in my own life um because i think that empathy is really I'm, i've seen many many very cynical colleagues who just want to turn the pain of others into a commodity that puts color in their dispatches i don't want to become that guy um I went back to Sarajevo last year for the, uh, f uh, because the, the, the conviction of Radovan Karadzic was about to happen. And we pretty much knew he'd be found guilty of most counts. And I went to see a young man I know. He's about 30-something now, and he was a child during the war, and his father was beaten to death in a con one of those concentration camps in front of the other inmates as a kind of warning. And uh, I went, he's a, he, the young guy is a, a professor of medieval Bosnian history at the University of Sarajevo now. And I asked him how important the Karadzic verdict was to him. And he said, uh, he said a remarkable thing. I've, I, it might sound paradoxical, but I always found this more emotionally difficult than the cruelty and the... He said, um, you know, I think about that guy who killed my father. And I think about his son. And he said this on camera, in front of a TV camera. And I think about his son, and I ask myself, whose shoes would I rather walk in? His, because his father is still alive, or my own? And he said, I, I choose my shoes because my father didn't bequeath me a legacy of guilt. And the best revenge that I can have is to live a useful life. And I thought, blimey. Uh, oh, and I, found it, I, fi I find it quite hard to tell the story, even now. And uh, that strangely, is harder to, to cope with than s sitting in front of Sonia Karadzic telling me that uh, only a few hundred Muslims died at uh, Srebrenica, as though a few hundred didn't matter, and, it was th and that they were murdered by Serbian criminals paid for by Bill Clinton. I find that, that I can handle that quite easily. And so I said to her, is that going to be your father's defence? Because <laughs> good luck with that. And, um, uh, but, but it's those moments of profound insight into human decency and goodness that in some ways, like with Malala, that, it, that it is much harder, I think, and stops you in your tracks emotionally. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, of all the stories I've covered, the one I find hardest to deal with um, emotionally is actually Zimbabwe. Um, and people are often surprised when you say that because, you know, it's not the same kind of war as I've seen in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. But I think the frustration of going to a place where, you know, this same man has been um, doing the same things to people. He's now 93. Yep. And, 93. Um, you know, he's... It's a really difficult story to convey because he's... Um, Everybody, every house you go to in Zimbabwe, somebody is sort of fading away in a corner. It's not dramatic. It's not people um, dying of hunger with, you know, those extended stomachs and flies and that sort of photographers want to see. It's slow, painful death that's been going on for a long while. It's the same story for years. So it's really difficult to get editors interested in it. And... Somehow for me, I don't know, it's difficult, like, if it's a war, you might not agree with why it's being fought, but it's, people are fighting it for a reason. But when it's one man doing this to his people just to the sake of staying in power at all costs, and I find that really hard. And I, I did think at one point of not doing this anymore because um, 
I'm a mother, <laughs> and um, I was on Benazir Bhutto's bus when it was blown up uh, 10 years ago, which was the biggest bomb in Pakistan. was very lucky to survive. And that same year, I'd been ambushed by the Taliban. I'd been in a hotel that was suicide bombed. And I was kind of thinking, you know, I'm um, riding my luck a bit. <laughs> um, and when I got back from that bomb, and I... Um, I mean, there was a moment, I suppose we should tell people, that 120 people died in that. 150, in, 150 yeah. people died in that in that uh, bomb attack. And, and your family didn't know whether you were alive or not right they couldn't get yeah, they couldn't well, get hold of you i was um that bus was going for nine hours before the bomb so at the beginning you know we, like i phoned home and said to my son hey see if you can see mummy on the bus and um on tv <laughs> and, um and then we it went on for hours and hours and i mean you I knew it was very dangerous because she'd had all these assassination threats. In fact, when I saw Benazir before she went back, she said to me, you must come on the bus with us because you were with us when we went back before. And then I interviewed her for the paper and she went on about all these assassination threats she'd had. So I'm thinking, I'm not sure it's really a good idea to go on this bus, <laughs> particularly as I just had a narrow escape in Afghanistan with the Taliban. So I decided I wouldn't go on the bus. I'd go on the media bus behind. But when I got to Karachi and I saw the crowds and saw her on top of the bus and everyone there, I just thought, I have to be there. So I got on top and we started going. And it was, you know, open top bus. And we were going under 15 bridges and flyovers. And I said to her head of security, how can you possibly protect her? Anyone on these bridges or there's people up trees and on roofs everywhere could have guns. And, and he just looked at the heavens and said, it's in God's hands, mm. which I didn't find very reassuring. <laughs> um, <laughs> and But then we went on so long um, and you kind of forgot about the danger because she was so excited to be back and there were... Um, women and children in the crowds and music and people releasing doves and you know you just got caught up in what was happening and we were on that bus so long that we ordered in pizzas onto the bus <laughs> as we were going along um, so when the, the but she did say to me when it got dark look have you noticed that as we're moving along the street lights are going off ahead of us and that in Pakistan is often a, a sign that something bad's going to happen. The streetlights will go off and men, sort of masked men on motorbikes, appear and start shooting people. So that started happening. These lights were going off. And then suddenly there was this bang and it was this bomb. And actually to start with, there was a small bomb and everybody kind of stopped. But then... Um, and people started getting up and I had covered suicide bombings before and I know that often there's a second much bigger bomb and that the first is just a way of getting people stopped in a place. So I was saying to people, don't get up, but I mean, within a minute, there was this huge blast and everything was on fire around us and just orange flame. And actually, you know, I'm, we're on top of a bus with a petrol tank underneath us and flame everywhere. And I was really thinking that the thing was going to blow up. But um, the main victims were that these young people, they called themselves martyrs for Benazir, uh, ironically, who were mostly like students and young people who'd made a human chain around the bus and kept the bomber from coming so near. Um, but we all ran and I, I was covered in blood, I didn't realise, and people were stopping me saying, are you all right? And I mean, it was other people's blood. Mm. Um, but when I got back from that, well, yes, as you said, I then I couldn't phone home because uh, we'd been on that bus for so long, the phones had all died. Um, and we also just dropped everything on the bus. So I, but I got into, somebody let me into their house and then I was able to call. Um, so I could tell them I was okay. But then I called my foreign editor and, to say that I was okay. And he said, why shouldn't you be? This is what I've just been through. <laughs> but, but that when I got back from that, I went to a dinner in London. The night I got back, which was to honour a really brave Brazil, um, Zimbabwean human rights lawyer called Beatrice Matetwa. 
And I said to her, look, I'm thinking about not doing this anymore because apart from anything else, when I go to Zimbabwe, I'm putting everybody I interview at risk. And what's the point? It doesn't make any difference. And and she said, look, if people like you don't report on what people like me are doing, what is the point of what we're doing? Well, that brings us very neatly on to um, dealing with what we're seeing as the prevailing narrative, which is being resisted left, right and centre in the United States. When you get the President of the United States talking about mainstream media being fake news, what, how, do, how do you deal with that? How do you combat the, what, what clearly feels like a, a profound shift as well as a profound challenge? I think it's unprecedented in our lifetimes. Uh, I think it's very dangerous because in do, just by doing their jobs and upholding the values that created those great newspapers especially, those I think those are the greatest newspapers in the world, the, ones, the, the, the big ones in America. And uh, just by doing their job and maintaining that tradition, they are in effect placing, them, placing themselves on one side of the partisan divide. And that's never happened before. But I don't see that there's any alternative. I think they have to write out. We've the BBC has fallen out with with, with successive governments many times in the thirty odd years that I've been uh, part of the BBC operation. And uh, the interesting thing is that the, the when when it has come to a, uh, a a conflict between the BBC and the government of the day, the public has always backed the BBC, uh, and governments have backed off. There's one exception to this, and that was the Jimmy Savile business, and that shook the BBC's credibility and trust quite a lot. Um, well, quite a lot of people would argue that the Hutton inquiry shook the BBC profoundly yeah. too, and, and that there was a sense that the BBC made concessions that they shouldn't have. Mm. Yes, indeed, yeah. But in America, uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a very dangerous time, I think, and, and the, inst the institutions that have truly made America great, and it is a great country, um, are being tested now. And I'm quite interested that the American Constitution is proving itself to be quite resilient. And I, when I lived in Paris, I was surrounded by anti-American sentiment among my French friends, and I used to defend America. One of the things I would say was they're still on their first constitution, and you, the first republic, and you're on your fifth. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's something to be learned. Yeah. And I, I lived on a street in Paris up which um, the American liberating forces had driven in, in August 1944. And um, I felt very much in, in that that was my inheritance what america had given to europe was my inheritance and so um and and but the institutions that made america the, the power that it became in the 20th century are i think robust and what, one of the things you learn about the american constitution that w was that the framers meant it not to facilitate the will of the people but to resist the will of the people to resist a kind of populism that would emerge claim a majority of um of uh, a majority support and use that to systematically close down or discredit um, alternative voices. And that's, what dis that's what's distinctive about Trump's populism, that because he won the Electoral College and is president, he therefore has a right to say, how dare you challenge me? I represent the will of the people. And if you challenge me, you are thwarting the will of the people. So there's something outside the Constitution. You're not just against me, you're against America. And that's, that's the dangerous thing about the tone of... of of uh, the, the, the Trump administration and the newspapers and the institutions of the democracy of the republic are really being tested now, and I think they're proving themselves quite resilient. Mm, they, they are. I wonder, Christina, though, that when you when you think about the the kind of news conferences that we see with that the president holds and the extent to which. Uh, journalists are willing to challenge not necessarily the person who holds the office but the office of the presidency it's almost as though people have absorbed the reverence with which the office is held if not the person who they perceive many of them perceive has denigrated that office yeah I think it was very difficult for American journalists to start with I was telling you earlier about um, a friend of mine who is on the New York Times editorial board and he was saying how they agonized about the f for the, f the first time that they um, said that Trump had lied because they were saying, you know, we it's the president, you know, we can't write that. Um, but I don't know if you saw, there was just a survey the Washington Post did that showed that he's now 
publicly lied a thousand times since taking office. And, you know, it would kind of be a news story now if he told the truth. So, um, you know, and when you have the president lying about saying that the Boy Scouts have phoned him to congratulate him and then the Boy Scouts say, no, we didn't, you know, that's... I don't know. I find it depressing. It is the first time since I've been a foreign correspondent that um, the US, whatever was going on and whatever you thought about the presidents before, was always a sort of source of stability. And now that's not the case at all. Nobody knows what's going to go. And not just stability, but stability of a particular kind, a stability that upheld the liberal order yeah, and the values that make this possible that make us gathering here and free to discuss and, and free to disagree with each other. We have a shared public reality. And I might disagree with you on and you and who you voted for. Did you vote for Scottish independence or against it? Did you vote to leave or to remain? But we're here gathered in one, in one space. And I fear, my fear is that that's uh, pretty much gone in America. And if you want a nightmare vision of the future, look at Vladimir Putin's mm. Russia, because it has become now absolutely impossible to know what's true in Russia. And so people place their trust in a strong man to guide them in the fog. And Putin, Angus Roxborough, has written a brilliant book about Russia, which is on sale in the bookshop. Um, <laughs> uh, he points out, of course, that Putin is not, he is an authoritarian ruler, he's, but he's not been foisted as a dictator upon the Russian people. He's a, he is an expression of the will of the Russian people who are completely at sea as to know what to make of the world, to, to distinguish uh, between what's true and what's nonsense. I have other questions, but I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, wait for a microphone, if you wouldn't mind. Do either of you suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder? Uh, if not, why not? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I mean, all, all, all I would say on that is... Um, it's, I think uh, one thing that's happened um, in my lifetime as being a journalist is technology has changed enormously, uh, which is good, right? So now I can send stories from the top of a mountain in the Hindu Kush or the middle of the desert. But it also means that in the old days when I did a story that was traumatic, I then left and went on to another story. And I don't mean to sound callous that I didn't care about those things, but you know, to stay in touch with the people that I'd interviewed would have required, like, writing letters to people. It was kind of complicated. Now, everybody I interview stays in touch with me on WhatsApp. So um, I endlessly get WhatsApp from, like, women in Afghanistan or refugees or Yazidi women um, in terrible situations and needing help. And then you feel really powerless. And that I find really hard. You can't... Um, you just because you hope that what you're doing will make a difference to people, and then yeah, actually, actually they it want doesn't. practical they help. Want I mean, more. is that what yeah. they want? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Alan. Uh, when I first heard that acronym PTSD, I thought it stood for post-traumatic stress drinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I shouldn't make light of it. It is a real thing, and it blights many lives, uh, especially those of combatants. And the truth is, most people don't get it. Most combatants don't get it. Most journalists don't get it. And you can't tell who's going to get it and who's not. It's not that the, the vulnerable or the emotional or the sentimental ones are more likely to get it than the sort of cynical, hard-hearted ones. It just doesn't fall like that. And when that uh, condition was first um, invented, it was... It was um, uh, because of Vietnam. It was to describe a syndrome being exhibited by survivors among the American troops who'd come home from Vietnam often many years after the events they described. And the American psychiatric authorities at the time set the bar quite high. Um, usually the, the, the sufferer had been, um, there had to be a signature event, a single event, and it usually, usually was an event in which the sufferer believed his life was gonna to come to an end where he was in actual, and it was always a he, was actually in, in mortal fear and believed that he was about to be killed. That was how high the bar was set. The bar has dropped many times in re-evaluations of it, and I actually made a program about this for Panorama, in which I interviewed a, a woman who had been given a diagnosis of PTSD by her GP and signed off work, 
and then gone to a lawyer to sue. And what the, her signature event is that she'd been, the taxi she was in in Southampton had been crashed into by a truck behind her at a red light. She wasn't physically injured, she got a fright. But she got, a ta- she got another taxi and put her shopping in that and went home and then began to have sleepless nights and stress. And she got this PTSD diagnosis, which I think ruined her life. The diagnosis itself ruined her life because as long as she was going through the courts to sue the insurer of the driver of the truck, she had to stay off work. She had to be unable to work in order to go to the courts and say, I haven't been able to work. And so it incentivized ill health. And I think in medicalizing that condition, in pathologizing it, uh, we've done something quite damaging to ourselves in civilian life. Um, and she, she would have been better off going back to work. She had a job that she liked, she, she had the esteem of her colleagues, and it would have been, it would have been much better. But, but when she, once she'd chosen to go down the medical legal line, uh, that was, it was an act of self-harm, I, th- I, th- I thought. There was one moment, again, going back 25 years, there was an episode in which I was involved when my, where my cameraman was killed, and I survived. And for a few months, for a few weeks, really, I sort of came apart and wasn't able to work. And uh, I, of course, blamed myself, because I was the correspondent, and he was the cameraman, he was younger than me. And, uh, and I felt I had his death on my conscience. And I couldn't sleep and and uh, couldn't really work and couldn't function. And I couldn't talk about it, but I couldn't think about anything else. And I thought all enjoyment of life was... I was only 31. I wasn't old or very experienced. Um, but I thought... I remember thinking, I'll never be able to laugh again. That would be a betrayal. I'll never be able to be frivolous again. That would be a betrayal. Uh, I'll never be able to fall in love. How can I possibly in- indulge myself in the pleasures of being alive when... It should be me in that coffin and not him. And this is called survivor's guilt. I didn't know that at the time, but, but I remember now very clearly experiencing that. Um, but PTSD is not a mental illness. It's a normal response to an abnormal event. Mental illness is an abnormal response to the normal world. And it goes away, mostly. Mostly it goes away, except, I would argue, for those... Uh, combatants who suppress it and suppress it and suppress it and use alcohol and drugs for years and years and years and their, their marriages end because of the changes in personality. Those are the, those are the ones who, who need that diagnosis and who need that help. But I think it's good that people are open about it now, that they didn't mm. used to be at all. I mean, I had a colleague who was off work for a year, 10 years or so ago, and nobody was allowed to talk about it. We all, if any of the other sections asked for her to do anything, um, we were all instructed to say she was on holiday. So it made everybody think you can't say that you've got anything because then, you know, it's it's considered some a stigma that people mustn't know about. There's a question at the back over there. Oh, Alan, some time ago, during one of the Iraq wars, I can't remember quite which one, you were talking about how difficult it is because of 24-hour news to put out a report that actually is truthful because you're constantly chasing the next bit and everybody wants you to be commenting from the frog's eye at the frog at the bottom of the well view that you, you necessarily have. That yeah. is surely part of the bringing home the truth of being asked to do too much in too short a space of time too often. Yeah, I, I'm because I'm so old, I'm a veteran, it turns out. <laughs> um, I've been spared the... the ravages of and the vagaries of 24-hour rolling news but it, it was a problem when, when the medium was first first came online and the, one of the differences between the 1991 Gulf War which I reported from Baghdad and the 2003 Gulf War which I reported from Kuwait and then later Baghdad is that uh, we had rolling news in 2003 and we hadn't had it in 1991 and when we were first getting used to having it there was a tremendous pressure, not so much to get the story right, which is what I cared about, but to get the backdrop right. Get to the right location, get your kit up, get your, get your um, uh, equipment up, and get on the air straight away. And I would say, well, I haven't found anything out yet. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll, we'll read the wires down the line to you. We've got a Reuters dispatch from, from where? Oh, that's 200 miles away. Um, and so we had a lot of those conversations, and I just refused to do it. 
I said, no, I can't, I, I can't, I can't say that because I don't know whether it's true. I haven't spoken to anybody. And um, so I became a cantankerous and people said, you're turning into Martin Bell, you know. <laughs> And I said, well, what finer, um, in, in, what finer ambition could I have? And so I was left alone to go out and spend the day gathering and come back with a considered piece at the end of the day. Um, but it is a problem. You're right to point that out, that uh, uh, the, the, the pressure to be first. We, and it's especially true in the BBC because it's public sector. It's public money. And uh, I've got great uh, um, respect for my opponents at ITN, Sky News and Channel 4 News. They're brilliant. Um, at this, but if Sky News gets something wrong, there aren't questions in the House of Commons <laughs> saying we've got to, I mean, we sometimes say, we sometimes call Sky News not wrong for long. <laughs> 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 because they can afford the luxury of being first. Because they don't have, don't all, the same pressure to be right. There was, I'll give you one quick example, because I see the other hands up. Uh, a few years ago, when Megrahi was still alive, uh, and but after the fall of Gaddafi, uh, there was a rumour came out of... Uh, Tripoli, that Gaddafi had, uh, that uh, Megrahi, the, the um, convicted Lockerbie bomber, had died. And so they said to me, get into that edit suite, do us a piece for the top of the six o'clock news, we'll check out whether it's true. Assume it is true. It's running on Sky News. And it ran on Sky News for about 50 minutes, and then they interviewed Adam Bolton, the great political editor. And I know Adam a bit, and I could tell from his face that he wasn't happy with this. I could tell from Adam's face that he thought this was baloney and he was being forced to comment on it. And I was about halfway through editing my piece at about, and at about quarter to five, they came in and said, stand down, it's not true. So Sky News just dropped the story. They didn't say earlier, we, earlier reports that McGrath had died proved incorrect. They just <laughs> carried on as though it never happened. <laughs> We, in, the, in the BBC, I'm proud to say, we don't really have that luxury because when we get it wrong, my goodness, they're going to abolish the licence fee. And... <laughs> but it is the sort of downside of the technology. I talked about, you know, that we that has made life much easier, but it does mean that you're under pressure to do things quickly. Yeah. So, like, when I started, I'd go off to Afghanistan for three weeks, there were no phones, nothing. Finally, I'd come back to Pakistan, have to bribe the operator to get a line. And, you know, so by the time I wrote something, I, you know, knew a lot. Whereas now, you, as um, Alan is saying, you're kind of expected to say things immediately. And I have just a quick story with about one of your colleagues at BBC. So just to show it isn't just TV that this happens to. So um, when, after the... Um, after 9-11 and we all rushed to Pakistan to try and get into Afghanistan. And I, like many journalists, were in Peshawar trying to cross the border. And uh, you might remember John Simpson crossed the border in a burqa. <laughs> and, um, and he did, I mean, honestly, you I might think... might remember, it, who would forget? It was a complete waste of... It was just to have a dateline to be in Afghanistan. He didn't interview anyone, he didn't see anything. He was just... But he could say he was in Afghanistan. So I got a phone call from my foreign editor saying, John Simpson crossed the border in a burqa pretending to be a woman. You are a woman. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, there's one last uh, comic <laughs> moment like that. My friend Colin Smith, who used to work, you know Colin, yes, who used to work for The Observer, opposite the great John Swain, your yeah. colleague at the Sunday Times. And it was in the days, they were in Cambodia, um, and it was in the days when you used to communicate with your desk through very, very short um, telegraph messages where you paid by the word. So there was this special language, telegraphies. And um, John Swain's, the vehicle John Swain was traveling in drove over a landmine. And so people were injured. And uh, Colin Smith says he got a telegraph from the Observer News Desk saying, Swain driven over landmine, can you match? <laughs> <laughs> that may be okay. an, urban, uh, an urban myth. But... Well, well, one, one last question here. You've got the microphone. Hi. I'd just like to know from each of you which uh, of the many, I'm sure, is your favourite correspondent and why? Nice question. <laughs> Um, well, actually, John Swain, who you mentioned, I mean, I grew up sort of reading about what he was reporting and Marie Colvin on the Sunday Times. And, and that's why I wanted to write for the Sunday Times, because I thought they were amazing and I wanted to do what they did. Really. Yeah, I'm going to say Marie Colvin. Uh, she was a phenomenon and she was also... And one of the things that made her such a brilliant journalist was that she was a good human being. And the connection has never been lost on me. 
I admire very much Anthony Lloyd as well from the Times, mm. same stable as, as Christina. And yeah, but he... we consider them rivals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, when I was a BBC radio correspondent, we used to say ITN were the opposition, but BBC television were the enemy. <laughs> Um, and, and in that last 50 minutes or so, we have so much evidence as to why these two are my favourite <laughs> correspondents. Thank you so much, Alan, Christina. Thank you. Thank you.